are, of course, uh, acquainted with the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. The story of a man, it's a, a tale that Jesus gives about two men, about a man who has two sons, uh, an older and a younger son. And the younger son deci decides that he wants his inheritance. He wants the money that belongs to him, and he wants to go and leave the house. Now, of course, in that culture, we may think that's not a big deal, but that's, a, that's an insult. Because you were not supposed to get your inheritance until your father died. So he's basically telling his father, you're as good as dead to me. Let me have what is mine and let me get out of here. And he does. And he goes and squanders everything that, that the father had given to him. But while he's away and he squanders and, and destroys his life, he comes to his senses, the Bible says. He realizes how wrong he was. How good he had it in his father's house. And he decides, you know what, I'm going to go back. And I'm going to repent before him. And you know what, I'm going to tell my father, if you take me back as a slave, I will be fine with that. I just want to come back home. And when he comes, it's a beautiful story. Tells us about the great love of God. When the father sees the son coming, he doesn't wait for the son to arrive. He runs to him and embraces him. And doesn't even give him a chance to do that great speech that he's been rehearsing about repentance. And embraces him as a son. He will not take him back as a slave, but restore him as a son. Of course, the elder brother is upset about that. And lets the father know that as well. But he lets him know, this son, of, this son of mine who was dead is now alive. He was lost, but now is found. We need to rejoice. Great story. Imagine that story two years later. Imagine the prodigal son says, you know, it was great. It was wonderful that despite the fact that I went and squandered and did all these things, that my father loved me so much that I came back home and he accepted me. And my older brother, he seems to finally be coming around. He finally seems to be accepting me again. I wonder what would happen if I did it again. I wonder what would happen if I decided that I'm going to go off into a far country and live it up again and then come back. Would my father accept me again? That's a wicked thought, right? There's a twist to the parable. <laughs> you know? But in today's mindset, it makes a great deal of sense. Because somehow that's the way we treat God. We treat God as the, uh, as the solution to forgiveness. That we can do whatever we please, and then God will always take us back in. God will always forgive us. Heinrich Hein, the poet, said, God will forgive me. That's his job. Wow. How haughty. And this is the mindset of the world that we live in today. So many people think, well, I can do whatever I please. I can sin any way I want to because God is going to forgive me. They see God as this uh, old man, old, beautiful, tolerant, grandfather figure in heaven who just let you get away with anything because he just loves you. Oh, they're just kids, you know. They're just kids. Sounds like me with Abby. <laughs> they're just kids, you know. You've got to have this mindset where you're like, oh, you know, come on. They're just children. Let them be. And that's how we treat God. But we're thinking, thinking, of course, that sin is no big deal and that we can continue to rebel and to do these things. Now, actually, this, there was an example like that in actual history like that. Uh, the Russian monk Rasputin, had, who, uh, who dominated the Romanov family for their, in the final years of their reign, had that mindset. He believed that salvation came about by the process of sinning and repenting. That in order to be saved, you had to continue to sin and continue to repent. And to show the great grace of God, you have to go out and sin recklessly so that God's grace can be manifested in your life and the life of those around us. And he encouraged this mindset. And today, of course, that mindset exists. How many times when people begin to talk about their sin, notice how many times when they do actually come to a confession time, there's always a place where they give in. Well, you know, I did this, but I'm sure God understands. Have you ever heard that? I'm sure God understands why I did it, the pressure, the this, the We justify it. No sooner are we repenting of our sins, admitting that we're doing something wrong, and we're now, oh, come on, but look at look where it was. Look at the society we live in. Come on, look at the pressure that I'm under. Would you have done differently? I mean, it's always a justification of sin, always trying to admit that there was some sort of uh, uh, circumstances that were just beyond our control, and we had to sin, and, and there was no way around it. Paul has been speaking about Adam and Christ, about two different ways. One is the way of rebellion against God, one is the one of faithfulness to God. And he told us that Adam messed up and took, the, took creation down with him. We went along with Adam, we followed his path, we became our own Adams by sinning as well. 
But God was so gracious, overabundantly gracious through Jesus Christ. And not only is he defeated the work of Adam and us, the evil that we had done, but he is going to overdo it in a majestic way and make the second creator, creation greater than the first creation. But then the mindset of some people might come, well, if sin brings such grace, then wouldn't more sin bring more grace? You know, shit, this is the way people really think. If I sin and God was so good to me, maybe if I sin more, Maybe there will even be greater things coming my way. And Paul says, rubbish. That is not the way to think. But he makes it clear about one thing. No matter who thinks that way or tries to behave that way, a Christian does not think that way. A Christian does not behave that way. Not maybe, might, no, no, they do not. A Christian who has been engulfed by the grace of God does not say, oh, wow, let me sin again that grace may abound even more in my life. They are so, they are so uh, overwhelmed by the grace of God that they would never even ponder to do such a malicious thing. They would never think, oh, let me, let me go and squander myself again in the world and then God will take me back in. Never. They're thinking, of course not. Look how generous God has been to me. That all that I did, all that I did wrong, God still took me in. I can never, I can never betray him. Not that we don't sin. We'll see that we do sin. But to actually turn away from him, to live in a lifestyle of sin, to not care anymore? Absolutely not. And the first thing Paul says to us is that to remember that we are dead to sin. Look at verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? He says, should we do this? Should this be our mindset? Should we behave like this? No way. Absolutely not. This is like a God forbid type of exclamation point. God forbid that we actually take the grace of God and make it so cheap and trample it so badly that we continue to sin without any thought whatsoever. On the contrary, he says, we are dead to sin. And then you, you might think so, well, I don't, I don't feel too dead to sin. <laughs> you know? But he says you are. Now, this is where it's important to know Paul's theology, to know how he thinks. Paul and, and C.V. Granfield in his commentary does a, a great job of showing Four different ways in which Paul thinks about deadness to sin. And the first one we find here, which is that decisive moment when we become Christians. At that moment, we are dead to sin. When you became born again, when you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, and God forgave you, He acknowledged you as being dead to the world, dead to His order, dead to sin, and now alive to the things of Christ. So you, it was a decisive moment in the past when you accept the Christ, bingo, you're dead. You're considered dead to the things of this world and alive to the things of God. And that's the first one. Secondly, Paul thinks about dead to sin in the aspect of being symbolic through baptism. And we're going to get to that in a second. Thirdly, Paul talks about being dead to sin on a daily basis. You have died to sin. You're no longer that person. Now live it. It's like someone looking and saying, this is who you are, now behave like it. You know, when you go to somebody, you know, when you ever seen the expression, you go, be a man. You know, it's like, <laughs> you're telling someone, come on, this is who you are, behave like it. And we're going to get to that one as well. You know, but we have to die, die daily to sin. And of course, there's that final decisive moment when we do physically die. And when we physically die, then we are finally completely liberated from the flesh, completely liberated from the domain of any sin, and we are free. But even right now, if you're a Christian sitting here, you are dead to sin. Dead. Not half alive. Dead. And we have to live that way. Paul goes on to tell us, of course, about that second death, the, the idea of baptism. He says in verses 3 to 5, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. Remember I said before that Paul, beginning in Romans chapter 6, is leading us through the imagery of Israel, through the imagery of the bondage in, in Egypt. Remember that we were slaves, we were in bondage, just like Israel was in bondage. 
And God sent Moses to deliver Israel. God sent Christ to deliver the people. And then where did he go? They went through the Red Sea, through the water, symbolic of the baptism that we go through. Paul brings this out in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, where he says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. One thing I love about this passage, and I think I've said it many times, and I'll say it many, many more times, is the fact that Paul's writing to the Corinthians, and they're mostly Gentiles. And yet he says, our ancestors. Israel is our ancestors. Now, I have no problem with that. I do consider myself part of the history of the people of God. I consider myself the Israel of God as well, so I have no problem with that. Some, some nationalities, I think, have more problems than others. You know, I'm sure those of us who've grown up in Hispanic churches, this story was our story. We never thought about it differently. You know, when I, when I read about the children of Israel being in Egypt and being in bondage, I was reading my story. You know, it wasn't until I was exposed to other mindsets that I realized, oh no, they want to separate that from us. But Paul doesn't. Paul says, we are the people of God. We've always been the people of God. The true people of God are those who believe in God, who have faith in God, who follow God. And we are part of that heritage. And the baptism, of course, is so important. Just in case you don't realize, how many times you see people getting baptized? In the early church, it was very simple. You accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you got baptized. Because they already had the theology, already understood. Today, people don't understand baptism too well, so I, I don't mind that they wait and think about it and meditate upon it. But baptism is symbolic of that moment when you accepted Jesus Christ into your life. Think about it. You're in the waters, you go down... And you're brought up. You die. You're buried with Christ. And then you rise again with Christ. But it's only symbolic. It's water. There's nothing magical about it. No special, you know, it's not like we bring water from the Jordan or anything like that. You know, this is just regular water. What matters is what's already happened in your life. The fact that you've already accepted Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. That's why when I ask you about baptism, the first thing I ask you, the most important question is, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because if you haven't, then that transformation has not begun in you. Then this just becomes a ritual with no meaning. But Paul doesn't see that way. Paul sees it as a symbolic uh, representation of something that occurs with us. And of course, he mentions the whole idea of being buried. And actually, in Greek, he creates a word to do this. It's co-buried. And he actually only uses it twice here and in Colossians to again talk about baptism. E East Umbel says, the event of dying of departure from this world was first really concluded by burial. Why does folk, Paul focus on burial? Because in his world, that's when death finally is finished. When you are buried, you're in the ground, you're dead. And actually, according to rabbinical studies, it says, you know, it says, uh, when, when shall I consider myself free from sin? He says, wait three days after you're dead. Yeah, and that's a, a rabbinic humor. But I said, yes. When you're in the ground, that's when you're finding this. Well, we are in the ground with Christ. We were on the cross with Christ. We were in the ground with Christ. We have risen with Christ. Now, he doesn't mean literally. It's a metaphor. People hate metaphors. They don't know why they hate metaphors. It's a metaphor to describe our new life. I was not there on the cross with him literally. If I'd known, I would know, trust me. Because I can't imagine that agonizing pain. I did not endure the pain of the sins of the world for you. Christ did. But I am symbolically there with him. What he went through literally, I am symbolically there with When he died and was buried, I am symbolically there. When he rises, I am symbolic with him. So now the new life that is in Christ is now also begun in me. Amen. Hallelujah. This is who we are. Sin can no longer dominate us. We're part of that new existence. That's why Paul says, we too may live a new life. Live is the Greek word for walking. Now that you are a new person, now that you've had a resurrection, live like it. Walk like it. Conduct yourself like it. If you see a person who's had a near-death experience, and they say to you, I'm a new person, and you see them living the same way they were living before, you're like, I don't see what transformation occurred in your life. I love when people say, oh, I had such a great moment, such a great spiritual time. I went to this camp, and oh, my life has been transformed. And you see them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, still behaving the same way. If you have really died 
to who you were and you're really alive with Christ, you are new. You are a different creation. Wolfgang Pannenberg in his Systematic Theology says this way, As the last Adam, Jesus Christ, is thus the original of a new humanity that is made anew in his image by participation in his obedience, in his death and resurrection. Christ is the image of God. He is the new creation. Adam is the old creation that has become corrupt. He is the new creation that obeys God, that is faithful to God. We are now part of that creation because we are in Christ. And we should demonstrate it by how we live. And with that, I go to the second point. We cannot serve sin because of who we are. You know, there's a beautiful movie uh, entitled Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Great movie about the daughter of King Henry VIII. But in the beginning of the movie, they come to get her. And she's concerned because, of course, she fears that she's going to be put to death. And Sir Robert reminds her, don't forget who you are. And towards the middle of the movie, as she's coming to her own, she looks at someone and she says, I am my father's daughter. She now comes to the realization of her status, of her identity. I know who I am. Many people are lost in this world because they don't know who they are. When you don't know who you are, you're going in every direction. You're like floating out in the water. And it seems like you have purpose because, oh, this is so meaningful to me. But then next week, this is so meaningful to me. A year later, this is so meaningful. You keep changing. You keep changing because you have no direction. Because you don't know who you are. It's almost like amnesia. You've forgotten. And Paul, in a very pastorly kind way, is reminding them, this is who you are. Not who you're going to become, who you already are. You are a new creation. You are made in the image of Christ. You have died and resurrected with him. Live it. Get rid of the old. Live with the new because that's who you are. Don't forget who you are. Again, if you forget who you are, yes. And that's why people have so many identity crises. There's so much identity crisis. Well, there are many sociological reasons for it. But certainly one of them is that we, are, we really concretely don't know our own identity, who we are as a person. And we keep trying to find something that will define us. Once you find Christ, that should be it. You have been definitively defined. I know who I am. I don't need you to tell me who I am. I don't need America to tell me who I am. I don't need the Pope to tell me I am. I know who I am. I am a child of God. You've got to know who you are. And once you do, you're able to live that way. And so Paul says in verse 6 and 7, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now when he says put away... That's a nice way. I think I wish sometimes translations would be a little. He means destroy, annihilate, get rid of completely. He doesn't mean put it away for next Tuesday. Yeah? So many times we treat the flesh that way. We treat sin that way. Well, you know what? I'm going to put it away, Lord. I'm going to put it away. And you put it away in the closet so you can come back to it. No, no, no. Destroy it. Kill it. Annihilate it. That's not who you are. Yet many Christians behave that the gospel is kind of like the opposite. That they, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's okay for me to go on sinning because I'm saved by grace. So if I keep coming back, there's no big deal. Yes, it is. Because the fact that you keep coming back to it lets us know there's a problem. That there hasn't been a transformation. That there's no change. If you can't defeat it, then something is definitely wrong. We should be able to defeat sin. Because we are in Christ. We are a new creation. The old is passing, the new has become the dominant. But so many people treat Christianity so different. Sometimes Christianity, well, unfortunately, because of our society, Christianity is treated like a club. Oh, yeah, I belong to the First Baptist Church. It's like, and I belong to that gym, I belong to the Palisade, and I belong to over here. It's almost like a club. I belong to the First Baptist Church, it's belonging to a club. Well, maybe, maybe. Maybe we can become like a club. But being a Christian is not like being in a club. Being a Christian is a transformation of life. A complete change. 
Not that somehow, oh, because I belong to First Baptist Church, I'm going to heaven and everything's wonderful. Don't you ever, don't you ever. I, I better not be there when you say something like that. Because if I'm, in, if I'm there with the Lord and you come in and you say, well, I, I belong in here because I was part of the First Baptist Church of Jesus Christ. Says, no, Lord, no. <laughs> Look at the tape, Lord. Look at the tape. I preached it every Sunday, Lord. Look at the tape. They're lying. They're lying, Lord. I said that it had nothing to do with being part of this place. This is a building. We are or we're not Christians. You know what proves our Christianity? Our lifestyle. There has to be transformation. You know, C.S. Lewis, in his book, his children's, one of his children's books, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, has a beautiful illustration of this. There's a young boy named Eustace, who's a nasty fella, to say the least. No one likes him. <laughs> I, think, I think Lewis uses the word nasty. He tries to say, you know, it's like one of those kids that nobody likes. Nobody likes him. And he, of course, doesn't care. He's just full of himself. And then he comes upon a treasure, a dragon's treasure. And he gets engulfed with greed. Oh, wow. I can take this. And he puts on a bracelet and he lies down in the gold. Ah, oh, mine, oh, mine, mine. When he wakes up in the morning, he's turned into a dragon. The greed has transformed him, has changed him. And now he begins to feel the weight of what's happened to him. And he begins to feel isolated because now he's not a human. He, he's not like, one, like everybody else. And he begins to weep bitterly and bitterly. And Aslan the lion finds him and tells him that he can help him. Now, Eustace has been trying by all means possible to get rid of the skin. But every time he tore into his skin, nothing would happen. Just be more skin underneath of the dragon. But when the lion comes, Eustace tells what happens afterwards. Then the lion said, but I don't know if it spoke. You will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws. I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. So I just lay flat down on my back to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought that he had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. You know, if you've ever picked the scab of a sore place, it hurts like Billy, but oh, it is such fun to see it coming away. That's the transformation. And then, after he's torn off the dragon skin, he tells him to go into the water and bathe and gives him new clothes. That is a picture of conversion. That is a picture of transformation. When Christ comes into our life, we have the dragon skin. We're still the old person. And he tears into us. Oh, yes, it hurt. If it didn't hurt you to, not be, to stop being a non-believer, then maybe you haven't stopped being a non-believer. Because it was painful. Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. You have to live this way. Oh, I'm so used to lying, but now I cannot lie. Oh, I'm so used to doing this, but I can't. It's painful. It hurts. And he rips into us. But he cleanses us and makes us a new creation. Unfortunately, you have too many people walking around with dragon skin claiming to be transformed. They're completely dragon. They say, oh, I'm a new creation. No, you're not. You're a dragon. Let him put his claws into you. Let him really cleanse you and then go into the waters of baptism and acknowledge that cleansing and be made new. He says, get rid of the body of sin. You see, the body of sin belongs to this age. But if you're dead... If you're dead, you cannot be enslaved. Like one, one theologian says, a dead man can no longer be enslaved. You can make me a slave while I'm, while I'm alive, but if I die, you cannot enslave me any longer. We need to let go of it. Don't let sin reign in your life. Look at verse 11 and 12. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so you not, do not obey its evil desires. If you really believe, if you really believe that you are dead with Christ, that you have died with Him, and that you've been raised with Him, then you are transformed. If you are not transformed, then you have not really died with Him, you have not really been raised with Him. It's that simple. Belief equals lifestyle. In our, in our mindset, we don't because we live in a world that can so, is so uh, distraught, where people say, I believe one thing, but they behave another way then you know they don't really believe it. If I really believe something, I act accordingly. 
You know, if I believe there's a lion waiting for me outside the door, I just don't casually walk out. <laughs> I'm, if I really believed it, if I really believed there was something, there was a head man waiting for me around the corner, I really am not going to go around the corner. You know, what we really believe, we act upon. If you really believe, then you have to act this way. But Paul, knowing that we are dead to sin, notice that he says to us, not simply that we've died to sin, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Don't give the parts of your body over to the use of sin. Yes, you died in Christ, but you can still lend out parts. See the humor of Paul? I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm a new Christian. But I can lend out my hand to do something bad. I can lend out my eyes to do something bad. Don't let the enemy use your eyes to watch something that is evil. Don't, don't let him use your hands and your feet to take you somewhere where it's bad. Don't let the parts of your body be used for sinful things. Don't let that little thing inside your mouth be used for evil, which we use it all the time for evil. We gossip, we lie, we do all these things. We misrepresent, we slander constantly, constantly. We, are, we, we give this little instrument, what is it, six sounds I think it is? We give this little instrument over and over and over again to be used by the enemy. And we indulge in the sinfulness of other people when they say something. Did you hear about so-and-so? Oh, yeah, I heard. What do you think? Well, I think. And there we go. Lending our instrument, which belongs to God, for the glory of someone else. We belong completely from head to toe to Jesus Christ. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're not to lend out our body parts to sin. It all belongs to him. What a way to describe that. But unfortunately, we're so quick to let it go the other way. But Paul has a solution. I love Paul's solution, which we're going to elaborate when we get to Romans 12 as well. But I love Paul's solution. He says, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Let me put this in a nutshell. Obey God, and you won't sin. Easy, huh? <laughs> right? It's that simple. If you are obeying God, then there's no room for sin in your life. Amen. Thank you. Somebody's awake. Praise God. When you get, if you, if you disobey God, of course you're going to sin. But if you obey Him, that's it. If you obey God, give yourself to God. Every single day when you get up in the morning, Give yourself, again, die daily to sin. It's not only that I had that great experience where I accepted Christ, it's not only that I went into the waters of baptism, but every single day when I get up, I get up with the mindset of, Lord, use my mind, use my eyes, use my mouth, use my body for your glory. I am yours. I gave myself to you X amount of years ago. For me, it's 35 years ago. I am completely yours. Use me for your glory today. What a different mindset. That people will get up and say, oh, I don't know, I, you know. I don't, I, just, I don't know why I'm sinning. Oh. Give yourself to God. If you give yourself to God, you won't give yourself to sin. Stay away from it. Now imagine. Put yourself back in that prodigal child. Away from the things of God. You were living however you pleased. You were doing things that were blasphemous, things that were rebellious, things that were just insulting to God. And yet God ran to you. That picture right there should humble us. Because it wasn't that we went searching for him. We didn't go searching for him. He's been searching for us. For every single one of us. And he comes after us. He runs to us. He embraces us. And he doesn't say, oh, you were a filthy sinner. Look how horrible things you did. Ah, my goodness. You know what? You go clean the toilets. All I want you to do is clean the toilets. You're horrible. And he says, yo, you're my son. You're my daughter. I want you to sit beside me. I want you to rule with me. Imagine that, the prodigal. How could a child who's been shown the grace of God so tremendously say to themselves, what would happen if I did it again? Wicked thought. Wicked thought. What Paul says, basically in this passage, a child of God has no such thought. A child of God has no such thought. 
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy. Where will we be, Lord? Where will we be if you had not taken hold of our lives? We thank you that you have redeemed us and that your Holy Spirit has transformed us. Father, help us now not to be influenced any longer by the things of this world, but to be influenced by the Holy Spirit to realize who we are, where we stand, and to live accordingly. We thank you and praise you through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.